Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas podcast, where attitude is everything on today's show. I, I forced this guy to be my friend. I remember first meeting him, hearing about him all the time, and he's sitting up in the back cave right now, looking all smooth. And uh, I remember, um, you know, connecting with him, and probably, well, I could say, I, I, I could say, there's two business mentors in my life um, that are on that next next level. And one of them is a, a guy named Dr. Eric Compton. He's one of my best friends, too. And he began to talk about this guy. And I was like, he can't be that cool. And then he would talk about him more. And I'd be like, he ain't that smart. And then he talked about him more. And I was like, now I'm getting jealous. Because I thought that I was very important in your life. But the way he talks about this man is on a whole different level. And you know when people talk about you when you're not there, in a certain way, you know it's that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a different level of truth that they're talking. It's been amazing to me to be able to see it, and as I've got closer to him, although I didn't like him at first because I thought he was taking away my friend, and my friend liked him more and stuff like that, and I started to have that jealousy and all that things. What I noticed was this was the first man that was able to take mastery and then take business and then take his mastery to another level. Because most of the time people are masters at what they do, but they have no idea how to apply it in a business sense and then skyrocket it. This man has both, which I, that's the reason why I don't like him that much. And so I reluctantly will have him on the show, even though he's probably one of the most intelligent guys that, I'll, uh, that I've ever met in my entire life. And he looks like Batman in his studio. Um, so please welcome Lord Dr. Mark Broomhead to the, uh, to the podcast. Wow, that's uh, exactly how I wrote that up for you. Well done. <laughs> so I, I know your time is uh, super valuable, and uh, you told me that you would give me 30 seconds of your time. Um, and I, this is the first podcast that I actually have to pay for. Um, I, I'm, I'm paying Dr. Uh, Broomhead for this. Um, I want to dive right in because uh, when I talked about the mastery part, like there's people who become masters at what they do and then they, a lot of times they leave a lot of things on the table because they don't know how to apply it in business. And for you, I have seen you not only take your mastery, but also take the mastery of, of our friend Eric and just shoot it into another level. How were you able to mix the two of these, Mark? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, um, thank you for having me. I've been excited to be a part of this um, for a long time. Kelly, you're just a great mentor to me personally. Um, the encouragement, the confidence that you're giving me is just off the charts in the very short amount of time that we've been working together. So you know what you're talking about. You know, I, you hear me praise you all the time, and I appreciate um, the time that you're putting in to me um, because we're all looking to grow and learn. And we're only as smart as the room that we're in. And if you're the smartest guy in the room, time to get out of the room. So that's why I'm in your room. This is your room. This is your house. Uh, thank you for having me. So I appreciate that and all the accolades you gave me. You know, it's interesting when you talk about our good, close friend and both of our mentors, Dr. Eric Compton, um, because he's such a genius and he is that visionary but we all lack certain skills, right? We don't all, we're not all the total package. I'm not the total package, you're not the total package. We could always benefit from being around and hanging around with the right people. So when I met Dr. Compton, I was early thirties, right? Um, and you know, my background being a dentist, I had worked in a couple of private practices and I had not owned dental practices. So that entrepreneurial bug for me uh, had not bitten yet, even though I knew that's where my career path was going to go. There's no question about it. Um, I come from a background of investment banking. I did that for two years before I pivoted to dental. So I had that unique skill set where I know the business world and I know the clinical dental world and I know how to talk to people. I know that customer experience, that patient relationship, building it. And I've been able to build um, a successful brand for, for myself and Dr. Compton in our community. So when I met Dr. Compton, it was the, the game plan was, hey, come, come work for me. Um, and I said, no, I'm not going to come work for you. I want more than that. And I knew his reputation in the community because it's where I grew up. And I knew it was, it was well, 
understood within the community. So when I when I met him and I said, no, I'm not going to come work for you. Here's what I want to do. And if you want to do this with me, now let's become partners. Most business partners in dental, um, there's a, like a two year honeymoon, right? Let's go. I'll go work for Dr. Compton for two years. Make sure we get along. Make sure our mindsets are the same, uh, how we view patient care and entrepreneurship and running a business as a whole. And then you become partners. He and I did that the exact opposite. I knew what I wanted right out of the gate. I laid out the game plan for where Dr. Compton had one practice, a very successful practice that his father started, his brother worked there, his cousins worked there. There's four Comptons working there at one time. And, uh, um, and this is nothing against him or them or anyone, but it was very stagnant for years, right? Most successful practice around, but stable, not going anywhere. That was not Dr. Compton's long-term vision and it definitely wasn't mine. So when I met him, that honeymoon period for us was two months, two months of laying out a game plan and then, all right, let's, let's do this together. Let's have a marriage. Let's make that business partnership real. Um, and now let's grow. Let's grow to the second practice, the third practice, the fourth practice, and so on and so on. So, so very quickly, we engaged in what we laid out in front of us. We didn't hesitate. We didn't pause. We ran with it. And it was tough for me at the time because I'm still paying student loans and I'm still in debt. I'm not, um, was I married at the time? Uh, yeah, I was close to being married at the time. So, but no kids. And um, um, so we were able to take that platform that he had embedded and instilled in Northwest, in Munster, Indiana, Northwest Indiana, so well and take the blueprint and double it and quadruple it uh, and grow the business that way. So, so he couldn't do it on his own and I couldn't do it without him. Uh, so we were very fortunate still to this day that we were as good of, as business partners uh, as we were. We get along fantastic. We're working on other um, business uh, ideas now. Um, but yeah, that's the, the key is, is we, we were both missing in an ingredient. We didn't have the total package to do that. But together, we did that and we knew that right out of the gate. So, Mark, help me with this because, you know, in your, you know, were you mid 30s or early 30s when, when you guys started off? Early 30s, probably just, yeah, early 30s, 31, 32. Okay, so at, at 31, 32, a lot of times people are dealing with not a, um, not a skill set issue, um, not, sometimes not even an experience issue because they know it's going to come. Most of the people are dealing with a capacity issue. But this is something that I've been so inspired by you, and I haven't got the chance to tell you is you not only have this unlimited capacity, but also you transfer that and you help people to see it from a different realm. So I want to dive into that part. And you don't have to give me exacts, but when you talk about coming into a business that's the number one in Southwest Indiana, right? The, like the number one, because I, I, I had been around and I had seen it. And then you're like, you're in your early 30s and you're like, ah, we're going to double this and then we're going to double that and then we're going to move on to this and then we're going to have, we're going to actually bring people in to be able to make it even larger. And you guys, where did your capacity, how do you expand the capacity and where did you get yours in the first place? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question is um, when I, probably the best way I can sum this up is all I knew is that I wanted to grow and establish not just a business, but a brand. You know, it's one thing I could have my solo practice and, and have a business, but that's very different than having a brand. And if you go, I heard this quote the other day and it made all the sense in the world. I didn't give it a lot of thought when I was trying to build my brand, but looking back at it, I'm happy that I did it this way. It's, I didn't go into the business world with an exit strategy in place, right? If you go into that, my, the, the business strategy with an exit in place, you are potentially setting yourself up for failure um, because you're just looking to get out. You're not focusing on growth. You're not focusing on the most important part of people. Um, you're not doing the right things to 
grow the business to then eventually get an exit. And I didn't start thinking about an exit till 10 years into this. And it really wasn't uh, an, the exit as the goal for me. I just reevaluated the marketplace and looked at consolidation within the field of dentistry, which was rampant. So dentist, dental offices were getting scooped up left and right, and I didn't want to have that FOMO and be off the bus. So fortunately for me, having that, to your point earlier, that capacity of having the right people in place to grow the business and scale it, I was fortunate to do that at a younger age because I had these just laser-eyed focus that I'm going to do it now. I'm not going to do it when I'm 45, which is what I am now. Uh, and start that, which a lot of my colleagues are just getting started, where, as for me, I just went gangbusters right out of the gate. I ate, slept, and drank dentistry um, to be able to build something quickly, and then the exit fell in my lap. I wasn't looking for it. It fell in my lap. So that was, I think that's the big difference there is having the capacity of people that you trust because uh, you can't do it on your own. If you think you can, um, you're, you're wrong, unfortunately, or you're going to get burnt out and you're sacrificing other areas that you're that are important, which may be family, spiritually, whatever health wise, like we talked about right before this call too. So, um, you know, that was, that was a big part of it. So with a person who's as hard charging as you are, intelligent as you are, and I mean, honestly, that's, that's the reason why I don't want to be really close to you is because then I feel bad about myself because of your, the level of intelligence. Um, when you are in that place, you constantly, and you just drop it in, it's not from a conversation that we ha have had, like we sit down and we ask about it, but you're constantly telling me, I've got a coach in this place. I've got a coach in this place. You're constantly asking for help. And most of the time, as hard charging, as the entrepreneur, as the alpha, which you are, a lot of times people are like, I'm trying to ask for help. That'll show weakness. But you show that and it seems to help you grow. Why is that, Mark? Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Those those alpha individuals, with which most people in my position uh, and, you know, doctors, dentists are, right, at least in, in the, our field, um, it's taboo to ask for help. Um, but for me, I welcome it wherever. My wife will tell you that. I mean, give me help here. Give me help there. What am I missing? You know, I, I don't like the f f saying this phrase because it is cliche, but it's so important is you don't know what you don't know. So when you get into that and you have, and you're trying to develop something, unless it's an all hands on deck approach, meaning not all your own hands, but other help and guidance from, from you, Kelly, how can you help me with, it's not so much public speaking as we talked, we've talked about in the past, it's getting the message through, right? So we can get over that fear of public speaking, but all right, now, now what, are you just up there to talk? No, Kelly Cardenas, how you're helping me to now get my message across, which is more important, right? Um, we talked about me having a, a lifestyle coach from a nutrition standpoint, from a from an anxiety standpoint. I have those people. And then I have my business coaches um, as, as well. Um, one of the things I've been looking for in this, I haven't shared with you yet, but I have an individual that I've been looking for my whole career from a business coach point of view. And again, this person just fell in my lap. His name is Michael Howe. He's the former CEO of Arby's Wendy's he was there for eight years. So I have someone now that on a weekly basis, I have a standing hour long, two hour long call, whatever he, I need from him. I pick up my phone and I call him and this is going into the, you don't know what you don't know. He's a wealth of knowledge and I'm trying to be that sponge and, and soak that in and being able to deploy that in, in areas of my personal and professional life. So as a, as a young kid, Mark, let's take it back to young Mark. I'm always interested in this, is 
what were some of the things that your parents instilled that gave you the permission to expand your capacity? Because there, there's a lot of people that are saying, well, that sounds good for Mark, but I mean, Mark seems to be Batman. He's superhero. Like he's, you know, got the, the squishy things behind him that stop the sound from bouncing off the wall. You know what I mean? He's the man. He's got everything. So it's easy for him to say like, yeah, I could double it and then I could double it and I could double it. But let's go back to young, uh, you know, young Mark. I'm always interested in the conditioning. Was it things that your parents said to you? Um, was it aunts, uncles, or were you just watching and saying, this thing is, is possible? Because most of the time people don't have permission to try. Where did you get that permission? Yeah, another really good question. I mean, my parents are super supportive of anything and everything that I do. I mean, I, 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 I'm being very fortunate uh, in, in that aspect. You know, we came from a humble uh growing up nothing fancy lived, lived in lansing illinois not a fancy town just a little blue collar town um but in terms of what did my parents do i mean they they just encouraged you know don't do drugs get good grades stay in school anything else you want you got and and i wasn't a bad kid so that would made it easy for them too but you know if i stayed away from those negative vices they would support anything that I that I did, and, and truly, that's what it was. Um, they were they were all hands on deck with my brother and I. Uh, my brother's got a very successful career as well, and um, you know they they just gave more the encouragement and were there as the sounding board that sometimes we all need, especially in early ages when you don't have. Now I have this coach, that coach, that coach. Well, didn't nobody has that when they're early teens. You know, when you're going through, are you going to go the right direction or the wrong direction, which is that, you know, that that period in life where you never know. Um, but, yeah, they they just provi provided that um, foundation of healthy home life and stay out of trouble and, and we'll encourage everything else that you do. So what what stops a kid from going off the rails because a lot of times you hear and there's another follow up question to it. Um, I've got them all day. But um, what causes the kid to not go off the rails? Because there's a lot, uh, again, there's a lot of times where a parent will say, don't do drugs, don't do this, and or they'll have them in this environment. And sometimes a lot of, especially in affluence, right? And, you know, you're in affluence and you're in these neighborhoods and your parents are like, oh, don't do this, don't do that. And then the kid goes off the rails. Whereas it seems from a very early age, you had a work ethic, you had a drive. Um, I mean, what stopped you from going down those lanes? Yeah, I mean, having that work, work ethic instilled in me early, here's a, here's a really good example. And I don't know where I got this from. I mean, my, my, my dad, my mother, my grandfather, they're the hardest workers ever, right? Um, as we all say that about their, our, our parents. But I mean, my dad would be pulling 24 hour shifts and I just see him working all the time. My grandfather, same thing. My mom was had her hands in every pot possible doing things, different jobs. Um, but I would be also that person that in school, let's go back to just freshman, sophomore year, high school even. I never did homework, for example. And they didn't force me to do homework, get home from school, do homework for the next three hours, two hours, half hour, whatever it is the night of. So from a very early age, though, what I did on my own, and this is probably crazy for most people uh, in in the high school years right now, it's 530. My clock is going off. I'm not setting an alarm. And I'm just waking up doing homework homework in the morning. Now get it all done in the morning of I had no problem waking up early. Um, and I still wake up at that time of day to this, you know, currently I, I have for my whole life. Um, so that, I mean, I, I think that's a big part of it. I, I would remember just waking up, watching cartoons and doing my homework uh, in between, you know, you know, commercials and things like that. But I would do it for like an hour and a half in the morning and then get ready and go to school. So um, I, I think that was just a big part of something I chose to do on my own. And then the other thing for me, and I don't know where this came from, but this is, this is still a big component of of my day to day is I've never been one to fall into peer pressure, whether it's in high school or college or, or, or just different aspects of life. 
I'd be the coolest guy in the room, but didn't have to do all that other stuff. Like I just found a cool way to, to, to not give in to peer pressure. And it, you know, when you're around those, those things, right. Those environments, when you're growing up and you could go this path or you could go that other path. I was just never, it didn't entice me. I just had focus from the beginning and, you know, I just, I had fun. And if I was in those situations, I either get myself out or, or it was just a cool way that I did it where, where I would just sit, you know, no, it's not for me. I'm, I'm, I'm going this way. Well, what I noticed Mark too, is that with, with people like yourself, uh, that, that when I say success, uh, if, if you've been listening to the podcast for, for the, uh, for years, you know, that when I speak about success, I have, it has nothing to do with money and things. It has to do with being in line with uh, what your purpose to, uh, to be. And, um, and that is the level of success that we talk about. But whenever I take a successful person like yourself, um, there's a consistency that I see. And that consistency is in vocabulary, right? And, and when I say the vocabulary, it's not that you're speaking a different language, whether it be Spanish or, or English or whatever it is. It's that you're speaking a language that is very, very consistent with the results that you get. And where I want to go with this is there's a language that you speak when you're raising money for a company that you don't sometimes, that you're not aware of when you're just doing a one-off business. And you have become a master at this. Can you take us behind the curtains at things that people need to be aware of when they're going from a mom and pop shop or one or maybe two off to being able to go to scale like you have been able to? Yeah, there's a lot of risk there, right? That's the tricky part of you have to, you know, what's that other uh, saying that if you're the, the the lobster stuck in its shell and you're trying to grow, well, if you don't burst out of that shell, you can't grow. So, so bringing out breaking out of my cookie cutter first practice with Dr. Compton was the hardest part. Um, it was significantly easier in a lot of ways after that first practice or breaking out of that, that shell difficult in some other aspects too. But, but once we did it the first time, all right, let's, we figured that out pretty quickly. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Um, but you, you have to refocus from what you're doing. So what that did for me is when we went from one location to a second location, how much time I was able to put as a dentist, right? Seeing patients, I had to sacrifice a little bit there. So it wasn't as much financially, but I had to take time away from the chair and to devote time towards other things. And again, that's how Dr. Compton and I worked so well together. Let him crank and see patients, which I was doing too, but he would just nonstop do the bread and butter, which is paying the bills and, and allowing us to endeavor into different directions. And then I would focus on, okay, well, let's look at, I need to get a, um, a building manager here for for to 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 remodel this location i got to get a new office manager those are hard to come by um financially yeah it, it it can be difficult to do that but once we got the first one in place and had that business self-sustaining meaning let's at least break even because it's not a profitable scenario right out of the gate um it took us about six months maybe even a little bit longer than that to start realizing, all right, we're going to generate another stream of cash flow from this. Um, but as soon as we saw that that green light of positive positive cash flow coming in, right away we went to the third and the fourth location, and really a fifth one too. Um, that's a different story. We had a, a failure on that one, a COVID related failure. But you know, I, I, every failure has its success too. Talk to us about the failure part of it. And I, the people who listen to and been rolling with us on the podcast, you know what I'm about to say. My brother always tells me that uh, people are more inspired by our failures than they are by our successes. Because a lot of times they're like, well, Mark's just a handsome guy. He looks like Batman. So he, he, it, just, it just works out for him. And then <laughs> they hear, wow, Mark had, Dr. Mark had uh, uh, one that didn't work out. Let me hear this one. You know what I'm saying? So talk to us about that. Yeah, and it's a big one. It's a big one that didn't work out. Um, I still think the idea is amazing. And I think at one point in time, it will take off. But if I backtrack it a little bit, so so I came up with this idea of 
having a mobile clear aligner, a mobile orthodontic clinic, um, let's say, for example, Invisalign, right? You're familiar with Invisalign, a mobile Invisalign clinic where I had a, it, it set up where I could, I'm, I would be an all digital dental mobile practice that focused on clear aligners or Invisalign. I had digital scanners set up. There's no gooey impression material. Um, I did my research uh, about this idea. I found like one small company that might have been doing something similar. Uh, another one that was maybe just up and getting started. So here's me thinking I'm first to market with this 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 uh, brand new idea, right? I'm going to run with this. Got Compton on board, pitched it to him. He thought it was a great idea, and and we went out, ran out with it. We got a, a Mercedes Sprinter van. Uh, I got all this digital technology. Um, I actually signed an NDA with a large, it's expired now, with, with, with Invisalign, who had also thought, wow, I, somehow they ended up hearing about this. You know, it's a $50 billion corporation at the time. And uh, their, their up market cap is very different these days. But at the time, that's what it was. And they want to work with me. I'm on to something. You know, this is, let's, let's see where this can go. So I took time off of the, the, the practices and we had some associates that were filling in at the time and Compton was doing that. And I was out trying to build this on the on our behalf because we did everything together. You know, that's that's what made us so successful. No matter what it was, we didn't take income individually. It all went into a pot and we split it right down the middle. So that's what worked out so well for us. There was no fighting over, you know, new patients, which can sometimes happen in dental practice. But but anyway, so. Fast forwarding, um, I, I've launched a website, Doctor Delivered Smiles, right? That was the concept. It actually came up in my time hop. It's funny they asked me about this today. Um, met with another coach, right? A web coach uh, at Click Studios. I'll give my buddy a shout out who owns that company in, in Chicago on Michigan Avenue. And we developed a business plan for it. And everyone that saw or heard of this thought it was lightning in a jar, right? We, we just hit this. Uh, uh, extremely well, we're going to knock it out of the park. And then COVID hit. Um, so the ability to be able to mobily go to someone's home, do digital scans and um, push this new concept, it it fell apart pretty quickly. So we ended up selling the van um, and just getting what we could for it. And, you know, we lost some, some cash on it, but we learned a lot from it too. Um, However, I still love this idea. So if anybody's out there listening that wants to maybe, I don't have the time to do it now, but if somebody wants to take that idea from me and use me as a consultant, <laughs> let me be their coach for that. I know what I did right. I know what I did wrong. Um, you know, because I do think, I, I see these mobile scanning centers, which is, which is a total new concept. They pop up a little bit here and there. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, every it failed ultimately and it doesn't exist today my website just expired not too long ago um i might have an instagram account related to it but um but we learned a lot from it too and you know you can't win them all i've had other failures as well different avenues and different ventures outside of my comfort zone outside of dentistry and medical um but what i lost here and here and what i i've gained from here and here it's more than the chances I took have, have won more than they've lost, or the the big ones have hit, and a lot of small ones have have lost. So, so I feel good about taking those chances because you have to take chances. You know, if you want to grow personally, professionally, you got to take chances. So let's talk about the let's talk about the language too, because uh, like I remember one of my buddies just exited from his company, and we uh, he had I've known him for almost 25 years now and when he exited uh he was he was going to exit the first time and then uh he stepped away from it because it, it, they weren't hitting his number and it was still a good number but it wasn't what he wanted and he stepped away and he he was we had these conversations he's like I learned all these things like I learned the the speak of of uh you know venture capital coming into my business and wanting to partner with me 
and because he hadn't been in the financial world like you had been. And so from that, he took it, and then he actually ended up uh, almost three times in the valuation, and two years later, he was able to exit. And when he did, he talked to me about a couple of things, um, you know, one of which was, you know, en enterprise sales was so much different than just, uh, you know, selling your business to a, a, a person, being able to get a multiple for it. Um, and he talked about having two sets of books. One, and when you're a, you know, when you're an entrepreneur and you have a business, a lot of times you run through things through the business, which we all do. And then there was the other set of books that was based off of having the type of EBITDA that would help a person to look at your business as it being viable and want to multiply when they purchase it. Can you talk to some of the language that people don't understand that when you go into a room, whether you're dealing with venture capital or a larger company that wants to consume you and partner with you, what are some of the things that a person like the normal person on the street doesn't know that when you use this type of language, it helps out in those situations. Yeah, I mean, right now, that's my world. You know, what you're the, the, the terminology that you're using, that's what I'm living through as I, I've made my first exit, right, um, with the four practices, and now looking to then put that multiple on it, having PE backing with a much larger group now. Um, but the, the key words when I'm in these board of directors meetings and things like that and presenting on on what is happening within our new group, it's it really comes down to growth. I mean, it's the it's the key word. It's, it's organic growth. Um, how which is hard because you don't think about that a lot when you have it on your own. It, and it doesn't just happen by happenstance. You do certain things to make them happen. And you might not even realize the growth is happening because of things that you're doing subtly. Well, now you have to pinpoint the exact reason is, well, why is this growth happening? Or why isn't it happening uh, to the scale that, that we wanted to have happen? So coming up with those, you know, looking at your, your growth metrics under a magnifying glass, identifying those key performance indicators, those KPIs that'll help drive or uh, um, a, a group or a practice, or the low-hanging fruit where those KPIs are not up to par. So those are areas that you can recognize as opportunities to help grow the practice. So that's that's the big thing there too. And yes, the word EBITDA, you know, be, with my business practice background, I've heard it obviously quite a bit, um, but I never looked at EBITDA when it was my practice. I, I did it differently because you run so much stuff through like you said earlier, through your own businesses um, and, you know, following the tax guidelines and everything. But now being part of this larger group, the word EBITDA is like every third word in a sentence. Where are we at with EBITDA? What's what's our revenue growth with EBITDA? Um, why are we struggling in this area with EBITDA? And that sounds very corporate-y, which to a point it is because you're now not dealing with your own money you're dealing with someone else's money. And when you do something like that, there's a whole different level of responsibility that comes along with it. You want to perform for other people. And in my world, that had never been the case in the past. I only needed to perform for myself, right? Or my, and my business partner. And, and I didn't have anybody to hold me accountable to things. Um, but now it's, it's just, it's very different. You want to be cognizant of in the investment people have made into you and what you've built and and you want to show a return on that so organic growth ebitda kpis you know those languages that, that's the type of language that is what i'm speaking now on on an hour by hour basis that's how frequent it, it comes up so Break down EBITDA because you and I are talking about it, right? And and this was monumental when we sold our business, right? This was monumental because when we we actually went we uh, when we were running it, um, it was probably two years before we ended up selling. Is what we we had to backtrack with my with our accountant. We had to backtrack and say, okay, can we run the numbers and and do. Um, uh, what what she called uh, chargebacks, right? Uh, you know, can we yeah. do some chargebacks and look at it as if my wife and I and our lifestyle was not inside the business? This was a for me because it helped us to be able to sell our business for a multiple. So 
but break down EBITDA because you and I are talking about it. We understand it. But there's people out there listening like EBITDA, like EBITDA, EBITDA. And there's some people who even use the word EBITDA that don't know what EBITDA actually stands for. So can you break this down for us, uh, Dr. Mark? Yeah, I mean, EBITDA, the acronym is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, right? So it's the true value or the true profit of a business, as you uh, just said, reversing out your chargebacks and what we call a Q of E, right? Doing a qualitative, a, a, a quality of earnings report to really determine what your number is, your profitability in your practice, assuming it's not yours, you're not running your health insurance through it, you're not running through, um, you know, the slew of other things that you can from a legal point of view, run through your own business, um, you know, corporate expenses, you know, celebrations and dinners and things like that too, team events. Um, so, so it's it's adding back those those one-offs to truly evaluate your practice, and then if you're in that venture capital, that private equity space, that's that true number that then you'll potentially get a multiple on. So, you know, if your EBITDA is a hundred thousand dollars, depending on uh, after all your chargebacks and the true profit of the business, let's just call it a hundred thousand dollars is what your EBITDA stands per year depending on what industry you're in. Dental industry pays a multiple of X, right? If they like your business and your business plan. You know, the the, the hair care industry is gonna pay a different multiple. Automobile industry is gonna pay a different multiple. So each industry has a different multiple associated with their EBITDA. So if you're getting paid, uh, or, or if a private equity individual offers you a 10X multiple based on your EBITDA, all right, well, they're valuating your your business at a million dollars. So that's what they're willing to pay you is a million dollars for that. And I'm just making up the numbers here. And you know, some other industry where um, the margins are tighter, right? Like the margins are tighter in, in candy, for example. There's a big candy factory in Northwest Indiana. Um, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue, I'll think of it. But um, uh, I know that their margins are very, very slim. So their EBITDA might be $100,000. Again, I'm making up that number but they're multiple, if they're looking to have an exit, it might be one and a half. So, so there's just a significantly tighter margin to in order to, to achieve that exit. And so for me personally, that multiple had to be, my EBITDA had to be high enough, my multiple had to be high enough for me at 42 years old to pull the trigger on that. I needed to know that those numbers mesh so I can be comfortable, my family's comfortable in case anything were to go south, um, to, to, be able to, to be able to afford selling my business and or not working again. Um, so fortunately for me, I'm still working with the company and I'm gonna help grow it and, 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 and go from there and achieve a, a higher multiple because we're gonna be, our margin's gonna improve and become better. So the multiple that I was paid on EBITDA the goal is to get a higher multiple for the people that saw something in me to invest in me. So that's my goal is, is proving my worth and, and getting that multiple higher from an EBITDA standpoint so someone else can capitalize on, on what they saw in me. So when we, when you talk about, when we, we, we hit on uh, EBITDA, then we hit on KPIs and KPIs was something that I remember I would get so intimidated. I didn't go to business school. Um, I, I just got knocked up the side the head a lot in business and, and had to learn these things. And I remember one time I was at a bar and um, this guy rolls in and he's like uh, his, his kind of thing. He's a good friend of mine. He's the number one money mentor in America. And uh, I was like, wow, he's a man. His name is Chris Noggle. Chris, you're listening out there. You're an amazing guy. But he's at the bar and he keeps saying this word and I'm like, damn, this guy is super intelligent. And he keeps saying it. I'm like, man, I don't even know if I could talk to him. And I got my back turned, but I can hear him and I'm just paying attention, right? To the and he keeps saying, he keeps dropping this word and he has like like, you know, swagger with the word. And I'm like, damn, like I'm not gonna be able to talk. I'm not even gonna be able to be friends because I don't even know what this dude is talking about. He keeps saying the word arbitrage. He's like, blah, 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 and the arbitrage. And I was like, damn, he's so smart. And then I did what I do every time I'm in a business meeting. I turn my chair from whoever I'm talking to, and then I Google whatever it is that they said. 
and I Googled the word arbitrage. And the word arbitrage meant the difference between two numbers. It was very, very simple. And when he was talking about the arbitrage, he was talking about, like, I'm making 6% on my money. I'm loaning or I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing money at 4%, so the arbitrage is 2%. And I was like, damn. Once I knew that word, then I was in, in the, like, in with all, and then I, I remember having another friend, and he was in the financial world, and I led with the word. And I was like, right when we started talking, I was like, man, but I'm all about the arbitrage. And my, and my friend sat back. He's like, damn, you're one of us. So help us with the PE and with the VC. What are some of the terminology when you go in to pitch that will help you to be in the room and them know that you're one of them? Yeah, I mean, having the confidence is, is first and foremost. So if you're leading with that buzzword, right, and and you know what you're talking about, and they know that you know what you're talking about, that's key. And, you know, you said you didn't go to business school, um, but even though I went to business school, you don't go to business school until you have the guts to do what you have done in your world, right? You And, and, and the same for me, too. I went to dental school. I mean, I went to business school too, yes, but dental school was in the forefront. And you don't learn business until you're in it. And and you have to dive deeper into terms of, you know, all right, I got to Google arbitrage. That's a new one. Well, I'm going to Google stuff too. I'm going to, you could Google EBITDA, right? And you can, it might not be as simple as an explanation as arbitrage just being, oh, it's, just, it's 2%. It's just the difference here. It's just the difference in numbers. You can read on EBITDA a thousand different pages, right? So being able to, to discuss EBITDA on that level in those rooms and discuss organic growth at a whole different level around those type of people that know it better than you, right? Because, or, or me for it is what I'm meaning. I'm the dentist, right? They're the business people. They're the professional business people. So you got to talk the talk. You got to walk the walk. You have to know those buzzwords. And sometimes that's all it takes, right? Just saying the correct buzzword arbitrage at the right time. But but there is a whole different language that you need to understand and know when you go into those meetings, for sure. What about when you're going to, uh, you know, when you're going to multiply, how do you know when it's enough? You You alluded to this just a second ago where you were like, you know, and you went, you went quick with it. You were like, Hey, I look, took my EBITDA. I took my multiple. I took what they were going to bring. And then I had to almost back out those numbers to see I'm at X age. Can I live in this? And can I accept it? You went through it just like that. Can you, can you break that part down for us? Because I think a lot of times business owners out there, they don't understand, right? So they're just like, I mean, a lot of people, don't ever position their their company to sell because they think that you know uh, this is my legacy or whatever it is, which is completely okay. But in most cases, your kids don't want to take on your business anyway. Should every single person, even if they're never going to sell, should they set their company up as if they're going to? It, it depends how how big we're talking. You know, if it is that mom and pop shop, and if you aren't able to capture that industry well, right? If you can't do that and grow to that second, third, third or fourth location and and the kid, you don't have kids that are interested in the business, there's nothing wrong with that, right? There, you could have, for example, you could go back to Dr. Compton having the one location. He could have rolled that out. None of his kids are in dental school. That wasn't the exit for him. He could have rolled that out for the rest of his life. He would have been okay personally, financially. It might not have been the vision that he wanted to do that I help bring to the table, which has made us both super happy from a professional standpoint, meaning, meaning we've built something, we've built that brand. So we enjoyed that process of it. But if you're asking for, you know, what was that number for me um, from a multiple standpoint for me to pull the trigger at 42 years old, it, it's it's not all about the numbers too, because there's a, you know, or the, the dollars, it, there's a certain level of stress and a quality of life that we've discussed earlier today too, where the, the, another dollar is not gonna make the difference. Um, you know, my kids are really young, they're three and seven. What do I wanna do for the next 10 years of my life, you know, as they're growing up? Do I wanna grow to eight dental practices and do this for a hundred hours a week, 120 hours a week? That's a hard no for me. 
um, there's no way there's too much into to life. And um, like you said earlier, how are we gauging success? Is it financially? Is it, um, did you accomplish your mission? Meaning I, I built my brand, I stamped my practice names into the corner of my community. Um, it's well known and, you know, not to give myself a, a pat on the back, but I'm very proud of that aspect of it. If somebody has a dental emergency, they, if I don't know them, somehow they know to call me. That's just the way that it works in my community or, or they call Dr. Compton and they get a hold of us somehow. So, you know, the financial standpoint, you know, if the multiple was half of what it was, I, you know, I could have still been okay with the deal. If it was double what it was, I still would have been okay with the deal. It was just, um, you know, it got me to be able to a point where now I can reevaluate what I want the next phase of my life to look like personally and professionally. So most of the people who accomplish and, and get a chance to experience what and enjoy what it is that you do, um, there's a there's a common theme too. Most of the time they come from meager means. Um, they have crazy work ethic. Uh, you know, they have the, the value system, all those things. And I've watched it over time. And then that person rises, right? And then that person has children. How do you take your kids and help them to take the baton and keep running as opposed to just consuming all the crops that you produced? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the joy of being a parent, right? Is to not let them have, you know, reap the benefits of, of your rewards, right? So I remember, and actually I, I saw this video the other day, I brought my now seven-year-old, she's my oldest daughter, I have two daughters, three years old and seven. I brought my seven-year-old who was at the time, uh, she's probably three years old and I was closing on a dental practice. I brought her to the boardroom, okay, three-year-old. Crazy, right? What am I thinking? This is not gonna go well, but I didn't care. I'm bringing my daughter there. She probably doesn't remember it to this day. Maybe it, maybe somewhere deep inside her, she's gonna remember that. Um, but being able to demonstrate that drive and I'll bring into more meetings, my, you know, as she's getting older, they, my kids love going to the, the dental office and it's not to get their teeth clean. It's to come with me and see me behind the scenes, you know, pulling the strings. They, they enjoy seeing that. So instilling that side of it in them, th that's the way it needs to be. I mean, my kids are going to take student loans out when, when, if they choose to go to college, I'm not sure, so sure that's going to be the right thing. And, 15 years from now, the way the world is, I don't know. Um, you know, there's so many pivots and different things you can do. And, and if one, either one of them get to get the entrepreneurial bug and decide not to go to medical school, dental school, law school, some school like that, if they, I, I'd, I'd support it, but they're going to take student loans out no matter what I might co-sign on them. But, but um, from a financial standpoint, if you ask me, it's smart to have the kids take the, the student loans out because even if I'm paying 100% of it, you want to talk arbitrage, I'll pay that low interest rate student loans for them uh, because I'll take, instead of paying that money now, I'll arbitrage it and I'll put it into something else that's going to make a difference. So that's my personal opinion on student loans, but um, who knows what the what school is going to cost then too. Um, but yeah, so... So, you know, getting my kids actively involved and my seven year old has looked at spreadsheets with me left and right. She wants to understand what, what spreadsheets are. So, so, I, you know, still very, very young, you know, when they get older, I'll, I'll be able to include them in a little bit more, but it doesn't hurt when you take your three year old to the boardroom. So, Mark, how important is it? Like, I have friends. Growing up, if I heard my friend's dad was a doctor, I was like, oh, you're wealthy. You know what I mean? You're rich right off the bat. But as I got closer and closer to the industry, there was more and more people who mastered a craft, a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, that didn't have the business sense. So they didn't know how to run the business. They knew how to do what they did, but they didn't know really how to run the business aspect of it. That's why I was saying at the beginning of the podcast, I mean, you're the perfect storm because you have a business background, but you're a master of what you do. How important is that to be able to have both or is it important at all? 
it's super important, unfortunately. I mean, you get, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but you, to, to take the risks, you better have the skill set or the confidence to be able to support those risks. Um, otherwise, things might take a different turn. And you can afford to make one or two of those poor decisions and fail early in your 30s, right? Early 30s, let's say late 20s, which is why I was okay taking the risks. But could I take those risks and afford to fail now? You know, some will argue and say, you can do that when you're 70 years old. But I I wouldn't have the guts to do it now at 45, like because of different life level responsibilities as I did when I was in my 30s. But, you know, you could, if you find the right mentor, you find the right coach, you don't have to have that total package, right? You don't have to have the business background to go with the medical dental background. You truly don't because 99.9% of dentists out there do not. You know, I've, I was one of two business um, students in my dental class. All right. And that was rare to have two. So, so you got to learn it on the fly and maybe that's not your thing. Maybe you don't want to build a brand or have your namesake within your community. Maybe you want to be that one shop. Maybe you want to work for somebody else for the rest of your career. That's okay too. You can do a fine, make a fine living. You can make your impact patient wise and help people out. You could do that. It's just how far do you want to grow outside of your shell? You know, how far do you want to take this? And the answer from the beginning for me was clear cut before I even went to dental school, I knew what I wanted to do how far I wanted to take it. And um, so along the way of me going to dental school, I'm still reading up on how do I open up a business? How do I uh, learn QuickBooks? How do I learn all the aspects of the employee benefits, right? HR, payroll, all that kind of stuff that nobody enjoys doing. But if you're gonna have the vision that I had for myself, you better understand that other to, to mitigate your risk of failure. So what do you look for in a partner? Like, and when I, we could sum this up really easy, uh, just get Dr. Eric. Like, I mean, the, the dude, the, the character of him, I mean, uh, I, I was very fortunate to be, uh, to be partners with him in a, in another business. Um, but the integrity that he has, the, I mean, who he is as a person, when you see him with his wife, when you see him with his kids, when you see him with anybody, like, I mean, there is all, all, uh, questions would, would lead to, yes, that, that's the guy. But what are the characteristics that you were looking for that a person that you could help them out in mentoring them if they're looking at partnerships? Because I see these things go south. I see a person with an idea and a skill. And then they're like, yo, I got this investor. But the investor that has the money is now in control of that person's vision and the vision goes away. So how, how, what, what would you say a person should be looking for or can to be able to circumvent that type of pain? in the future. Yeah, I, I mean, that's that's a tough one, right? You know, if you're putting your vision in someone else's hands because they control the dollar figure, right? If, they, if they're if they now the puppet master um, because you have to prove your results, you just have to be prepared to do that. So if we look at it from an associate standpoint, so let's say I'm hiring doctors to come work in my practices. Well, you, you have to have a certain skill set and you have to have an open mind to be able to grow the next level of your career. So I had an interview the other day with a, with a doctor. Actually, was it uh, not yesterday, the day before. And uh, it was a newer grad right out of dental school. And I just said, well, what do you like doing with, within dentistry? Tell me what you enjoy about doing that. And so let me see if I can find a spot for you. And instead of telling me what she enjoyed about dentistry, she told me what she doesn't like doing. So she came in saying, I don't, I don't like doing this, 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 and this. The other doctor can do that stuff. I'm just gonna do this and this. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, you're right out of dental school. You're already taking out the five top services. And if I if I went through sharing these services, like, how can you not do those things and then call yourself a dentist? I was blown away by this. And um so I, I didn't even move forward with it, obviously a second interview, but you know, for, to come out of the gate saying you're not willing to do X, Y, and Z, and I'm not saying I did it the right way, but I came out the exact opposite. 
throw everything at me and I'm going to learn it even better than I did in dental school. But I want, I don't want to, I want to use it so I don't lose it, right? So you, you learn it in dental school, you better put it to work so you don't lose that skill set. And if you go one or two years without doing those things, you're not going to pick up on that again. You're, it's a lost cause. It, there's cobwebs that are collecting around your skill set. So you got to put it to work. And, you know, that's what I would encourage anyone in any field, um, because it, you can take that and apply it to anything. Go, you got to go gangbusters out. You know, don't be afraid of things that you aren't comfortable with right out of the gate. Get comfortable with them. And you know, I could say, I man, working on kids right out of dental school when I'm 27, 28 years old, and I had a baby face at, at the time, and I got mom and dad behind my shoulder. That's some tough work on a screaming kid, right? That's just, nobody wants to do that stuff. But now it's second nature, right? You, you know, you can uh, you, you become uh, the the mastro in in that operatory at the time be something simple it could be a difficult surgery or case so you you own that so so it took me 17 years I, i've been comfortable with it for a number of years but it's because i i right i went right with it and i didn't dust it under the rug at the beginning of my career so i don't know if that answers your question exactly but mm -hmm. it's a roundabout way maybe well, there's another thing in common with alphas, right? And especially with high performers. And when I see this in high performers in business, there's a commonality. And and what I find that suffers a lot of times is the their their relationships, um, their marriages a lot of times, their relationship with their kids. Um, this is a thing that I admire, and I've got to admire it from afar without you knowing that I'm watching, um, but I've been watching. And I think it's so cool that you've been able to have you know, uh, when I say have your cake and eat it too, a lot of times, I mean, this is what we made the hideout for. I made, I made the hideout for because there's so many high flying people in business and they lose their joy in life and then they lose their joy and they wonder why their marriage, you know, it suffers or they wonder why their relationship yeah. with their kids. And I, I said the joke to these guys one time, I spoke at a financial convention and I said to them, I said, guys, what if I had uh, an insurance policy for 50% of your net worth, 30% of your uh, income in perpetuity, and your mental health? And I had an a insurance uh, policy for that. They were like, I'm in. I'm buying. Everyone in the room raised their hand. And then I paused, and I just let it go for a bit. And then I said, stay married. And, you know, it was like it, it was a delayed reaction, and then they all laughed. And then they all were like, oh, I get it. Because a lot of times we lose it when we're going through. How have you been able to, I don't call it balance because I don't believe in balance, but how have you been able to keep a healthy relationship with your wife and your kids, meanwhile growing, I mean, a, like an incredible, outstanding business? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you on balance, call, calling it balance. It, it, it's just, it's work hard, play hard mentality. And when it comes to relationships and what you could potentially lose by putting too much focus on one aspect of your life. And it doesn't have to be business, but let's say business for, for today. But if you're focusing too much on that, something's going to suffer from, from some direction. You, you can't, you can't focus all of here and expect not to pull away time from somewhere, from somewhere else or some person else. So, you know, with, with my wife and kids, um, this was an all hands on deck approach, meaning we knew the time, to, to take this endeavor from being a dentist to now being an entrepreneur and growing something to the level that, that I always say we, that my wife and I grew this together because it's a team effort. Um, that that's the only way to do it and have that insurance policy, like you just mentioned, right? Have the happy life, happy wife, happy life. Um, but you know, we, we, we went, I always have that mentality. We, we we're doing this together. So I think that's super helpful to do that. And, and it's got us to the point that we are, we're, you know, I think I told you earlier, we're one month away from our 10 year anniversary. Uh, so we're just starting to plan that a little late to the game on planning it. But, uh, um, but yeah, you know, and the same with the kids. And when I went into this, I knew that if things were starting to suffer with kids, family, I had the opportunity because of what I built to be able to pull back and take away from what I'm doing professionally in a business standpoint and refocus it. 
So that's actually one of the things that got me into the dentistry is I just went through the checklist of if I need to work more, I can work more. If things are good and comfortable and I'm working for myself, uh, I can take time away. If something comes up, if somebody gets sick, um, if, if there is a, a family issue or emergency, I can easily pull back. Um, so that that's the vision that we set up, my wife and I set up for ourselves to be able to have that type of lifestyle. You know, we're not really truly answering to other people. We're running our own marathon and, and we made that decision together. We're going to buy this together. We're going to grow this together. We're going to build this together and we're going to support each other uh, along the way. And, you know, our, our, our kids are, are fortunately good, healthy kids. And, and, you know, that's the most important thing in life, if you ask me. Um, so, so it, you know, without using the word balance, you know, you got you to give and take. Well, Mark, uh, the whole reason why I started the podcast is because my kids. Um, Maddox, who's 11, who's a, I mean, just absolute superhero cartoon character. He's hilarious to be able to spend time with. My daughter has the craziest sense of humor. She's so sarcastic and she is the artist in the family. She's the actress, the writer, um, the feeler, and she has uh, an incredible heart. But I, I started the podcast because I wanted to take iconic people like yourself and I wanted to show my kids that the Dr. Marks of the world are not superheroes. They're simply human beings that have crazy, uh, uh, the, the amazing attitude and crazy work ethic and that have focus that other people don't have focus in, you know, in areas. And so what advice would you have for Maddox and McKenna? And if you could use both their names, it would be awesome. Yeah. So Maddox and, M and McKenna, if I'm talking to you and uh, outside the podcast and feel free to call me, you, you can get your number, uh, my number from your dad. The, the key thing is, is just, as we talked about earlier, is stay focused. You know, you still, you're, you're young enough to, to develop that, but um, don't give in to peer pressure. It's not worth it. It's, it's the silly thing. Make a joke out of it. And, and, and just get in that habit of maybe waking up early, getting your homework done early, um, leaning on your dad your, and your mom, leaning on your parents because they're not going to steer you wrong. I mean, Kelly, you're, you're just not going to do that. You, you know that you're you're the rock. Your wife's the rock. Um, you're going to guide your kids in the in the right way. So so Maddox McKenna, just listen to your mom and dad. They they know the vision. Now it might not be the exact vision that you have for yourself, and you're going to pivot along the way. You might be an investment banker that turns a dentist that has an exit, and then is now doing something weird and different. I don't know, but there's a lot of different pivots along the way. And, and you're going to need your mom and dad to help steer you on the right course. But peer pressure, it's a, it's a pretend thing. Just the, this, It's easy to say no to those things. Dr. Mark, you have been absolutely phenomenal. I want to have you on the show more and more. And now my kids have Uncle Mark. Uh, yeah. Uncle, Uncle Mark, uh, to be able to have it, man. You have been absolutely tremendous. I want to thank you for your time. And uh if you're out there listening, which I know that you are, and I want to thank every single person that has helped our uh, podcast to get in the top 1% globally. And that's not because we advertised or we uh, manipulated the numbers. That's organic growth. Um, and it's because every single one of you who has been listening, who has been sharing, and we want to thank you. Dr. Mark, you don't know this, um, but the podcast is actually about to hit a milestone. Um, and it should within the next week. Um, we're, we're just, we're at 98,700 downloads right now. We're just about to go over a hundred thousand. And, um, I believe that, uh, you should send this episode out because the, the, the bombs that Dr. Mark dropped, uh, were absolutely phenomenal. So share it with your friends. Thank you to all Thank of you. our sponsors, our new sponsor. You'll like this one. You'll like this one. It's that one up in the corner right here. It's called Raven Drum, and Raven Drum is, uh, was started by uh, Rick Allen, the, uh, the drummer from Def Leppard. And um, he is creating these drum circles, and uh, it's all about mental health and, and uh, helping awareness for mental health. So, um, Dr. Mark, you have been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I love you. You're the man. And, uh, You're the man. I, love I, you I, too, brother. I appreciate you, man. You're officially off the hot seat. Thank you.